Okay, we're back live. Uh, day one of IBM's Information On Demand. This is Silicon Angles, the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the ceiling from the noise. I'm John Furrier. I'm joined with my co-host, Dave Vellante. As usual, um, we are here to break down and extract the signal from the noise and share that with you. And uh, we'd love to have analysts on. We had J Judith Horowitz on. She's trending on the Twitter board. Um, and, and one other person who's also trending is Merv Adrian with Gardner, Cube alum, very authoritative in the space. Well, welcome to have you. Great to have you back on the Cube again. Seems like we just did this last week. Last week in Big Data NYC, yes. our event uh, that was going on around Strata Conference and Hadoop World. Kind of geeky Hadoop meets business mainstream here at IBM. Uh, what's your take? Obviously, you sat through the sessions. We were following your tweets. Um, and uh, just what's, what's your, what's your uh, report card day one for IBM? Um, as always, overwhelmingly large. Um, 13,000, I think, is the number here. Um, it has to be seen to be believed if you've never been to one of these events and, and you have some idea of the scale of, of these, uh, these venues in Vegas, but you come out of an event room, you come out of a ballroom, you, and you can't move in the hallway for three it's or four Tokyo minutes. It's subway, isn't it? It is extraordinary, the, the number of people who are here. So those of us who've done it a few times have learned a few of the back ways. Um, through the garage, <laughs> up over the roof, Stairways. down the Speed down the uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's it's an amazing crowd. It's an extraordinarily mixed crowd. To your point, John, there's a a lot of suits here, um, a lot more suits than there were at Strata. A lot of people who are very interested in the business side, and even in a session that I just sat through that was talking about competitive displacements by IBM. Um, two of the people on the panel basically said, "Look, I didn't really want to hear too much about the technology." Um, it was as much about my relationship with the vendors I was working with as it was about the technology. And that's always been one of IBM's strengths, is that they have a lifetime view of customer value and they, they, they uh, cultivate their relationship very carefully over the years. So they do very well within their base. Their bigger challenge and, and what we're seeing here uh, is how do they reach outside of that? How do they reach the, the folks that are not already BlueStack loyalists and get them to come over? Yeah, so because they talk about how they're reaching out beyond that base, but it's, it's, I'm correct in that 90% of the business, if not more, is with the blue stack. Is that a fair assertion? I think the numbers are that something like 80% of IBM's revenue comes from 20% of IBM's customers. Yeah, so. Um, so right there, even within their own base, you're seeing a very strong concentration. Clearly, they have a strong base in companies that have the highest of mainstream requirements for security and reliability, uh, the big banks and so on, and that remains true, but their, their big focus in several of the speeches here was ease and simplicity. And that's a story that has to be told with pictures and they didn't do that effectively today. They so did not thought, do that They did not do that effectively today. If you want to tell me about how simple your GUI is yeah. and how easy it is to use your product for discovery, then don't use 5,000 words to do it. Put five <laughs> pictures on the stage and show me that. Show me, right. They didn't do it. And Sir, service missed. now, Tableau, Splunk. <laughs> Listen, there's a, there's a great tool here called Discoverer, um, which IBM has that is a, a marvelous way for an entry point into the unstructured and new data that people are trying to work with that gives you a way to go uh, play with it, find something useful, and then persist something that will be of value, which is the, the, next, the inevitable next step of most people's early big data experiments. And right now, that's an area where the, the big data community in general, all those folks we saw at Strata last week, this is where things begin to break down for them, right? It's great for those first few experiments. Then you've got to make some architectural choices. Where am I going to persist the stuff that I'm going to use next week and the week after that? Um, and IBM has a great portfolio of pieces that can be put together to tell that story. That's what they need to be doing, and today, I heard about the portfolio. I didn't hear about that story. I didn't. I didn't hear a narrative, and and the narrative is there to be told. So, I think they'll get better at I mean, it. I think. I think one thing that seems awkward, but I mean, seems really relevant, but awkward the way they're. they're we we'll get to this tomorrow, maybe. Is the social business is a great story. I mean, that that kind of to me is the the face of the analytics, which is geeky. You know, value chain, yep. process improvement. But the social business kind of hits the rubber meets the roads. It's the user shaking their smartphone and getting analytics rather yeah. than you know some chat application or you know the, the real changes on the society. Um, did they tease that out today, or were they saving that? No, I think for they tomorrow? did it very, very effectively in multiple places in financial services, in healthcare, uh, in smart metered solutions for the industrial internet. You know, the same themes we're hearing elsewhere. 
Um, what they're doing very effectively is pulling out the stories where people have had that kind of an impact. Again, the challenge is to show people you can do this too. Uh, so and that was one of the best things said from the, uh, from the podium by our host today, um, the guy from the National Geographic, his name escapes me. J um, uh, Jason? Thank, Jake. Yes. Jake, Jake, Jake Horway. Uh, Horway. He was wonderful. He did a great opening. Uh, and he put up some wonderful visualizations and he said, you know, this is about big data. Look at how they've combined this data with geography. You know, wouldn't it be great if you can do it too? You can do it too. Uh, it, was, it was perfectly staged. He, he just conveyed it. Very, very nice. Well, us old school PowerPoint uh, <laughs> users are, you know, still clutched to text and seven bullets and a title and, you know, 14 <laughs> fonts. Just make them 44 you know. point, please. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no more than five words. So, honestly, it's a tough story to tell. I mean, to me, my takeaway, I want to get your opinion on this uh, from both you guys. This is a complex story to tell. I'm talking about big data analytics. You've got Hadoop from everything else under the covers, Blue Acceleration. You've got uh, cloud and mobile, which are under the hood. A lot of technology issues there. Nuances, data governance, information governance. Then the social business is, is, a, is a paradigm, mind-blowing paradigm shift. To try to tell that together is hard. At the same time, they get customers deploying this stuff and having successes on top of it. So Lots of them. business outcomes, that consultative journey, yep. and the implementation at production scale. I mean, all those things jammed into one makes for it a hard story. I mean, well, how it, do depends, you it depends on how you tell it. If you tell it as a story, uh, and if you abstract away from the complexities of, of an extraordinarily large product portfolio, um, then there's a message to be told there. Then there's another message to be told when you do get into the details of the product portfolio. IBM has to do both. Um, and sometimes they seem caught between skill and pregnant, You know, right? my they, half pregnant, you know, stuck in the middle, whatever you want to say. Yeah. Well, do you feel you, that, th that day one kind of stuck in the middle? Or... I think they hit elements of both ends of the spectrum, but spend a lot of time kind of in between them, not quite doing enough on either end. Um, that said, I think it all depends on what you bring to the conversation. I, I wandered in, really not intentionally, to uh, one of the enterprise content management sessions. That's not really my sweet spot, but it was a great discussion. And it was a, a discussion that, as they discussed unstructured data, sounded very much like what us DBA style geeks are talking about over on the, on the Hadoop side of the house with a different set of business issues, but being um, realized and driving value uh, at least, if not more effectively, and especially with the connection to the social side of things. So they've got the story. Um, well, we, we were talking about the 80-20 before, 90-10 yeah. or whatever it is. Does IBM actually have to move beyond that base to succeed? I mean, uh, you know, most businesses, if most of their startups, get most of their business from their existing customers. Sure. It's a great question. Yeah. What's your definition of success? Yeah. Um, and I talk to the guys in the various Wall Street firms all the time, and they're always worried about the change in the slope of the curve. It's the area under the curve that matters, right? There's a lot of money down there underneath that line. There's a lot of customer value. There's a lot of recurring revenue, and IBM's doing just fine there. Uh, do they need to have a much larger user base of lots and lots of new users today? Um, well, I don't think so, but it wouldn't hurt, would it? And, it? and it's awfully nice to be able to position yourself as leading people into the future as opposed to being the place where they'll go when they grow up. Yeah. And I think a lot of people today, as their systems do mature and require these, these more significant enterprise class features, will inevitably migrate to my IBM technologies. That can, that can answer those it's questions. It's the area well. under the curve dilemma, right? You get Amazon, and makes, last quarter made $7 million, and it's a 70, $75 million, billion dollar company, made yep. $7 million in profit, and the stock goes up. I, IBM throws off you know, more cash, free cash flow than... And IBM said imagine. from the stage today that their bare metal implementation performs twice as well as Amazon's. Yeah. And now, I haven't benchmarked that, but that's a nice assertion to be able to make. <laughs> Performance, is that why people go to the cloud, though? Right? So that's... Kind of That's probably not why they go there at first. Kind of an interesting so data point. I got to ask, but, I, but, but performance is a second-order variable. Meaning, if everything's equal, first I yeah. first I explore, I discover, I find value. Once I do, and I put this into production, then I start thinking about how can I do this more cost-effectively? Yeah. How can I do it with better performance? How can I make it more stable, secure, reliable? That's when people come to IBM. And they're still well positioned for answering those questions when those questions come up. Competition right. out there for these guys. Obviously, we were talking about soft layer as a bolt on, trying to figure out cloud. Dave's yeah. high on it, I'm not. Um, what's your take on their moves in the cloud and just their relative to their competition? 
Not my sweet spot, but I think that IBM has the assets and the, and the spread uh, and the portfolio to be a formidable competitor there if they choose to go there. The interesting challenge for anybody who wants to compete with Amazon is Amazon's stated mission. Right? We will be the low margin supplier. Can you think of another IT vendor who says that? Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and, and by the way, the and by the way, they're innovating. Yeah, and, and they're, they're disrupting and innovating, and will go push the commoditized margin to the to the close to zero. I think their margins are a lot higher than people may realize too. By the well, way, well, they're shifting the margin. They, they seem to be able to drop their <laughs> prices pretty frequently. <laughs> yeah. It's called cross cross. Although doesn't everybody, Merv? They just don't announce it. They don't market the fact, right? I mean, doesn't doesn't everybody's price drop every quarter? Or? No. No? <laughs> in a word. But the cost do, right? No, they introduce a new product and increased price. The cost of compute and storage drops every quarter. Are you saying they don't pass that on to customers? It's shocking, isn't it? Isn't it I shocking? thought you guys kept them honest on that. Bro. No, we try. <laughs> we try. We do our best. But um, then there's always new features they can add to the product and charge right. for. Um, okay. Right. Merv, we've got to wrap up. We have... Uh, we just got started, John. <laughs> All right, Great next to week. have you on theCUBE. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll see you tomorrow. That was the shortest CUBE <laughs> segment we've ever done with Murray. That's okay. I know, we have, right. to, we have the pressure because the uh, analyst dinner uh, from uh, Inhee Chu uh, wants to come on and uh, thank I, you for your time. I defer to the lady anytime. Yeah, she's a uh, uh, rock star and a CUBE alumni. She's been on more times than you, but all you're catching up to her. Yeah. Uh, Doing my best. You know. <laughs> I'm trending. Thanks, guys. Uh, Merv Adrian. Um, Analyst at Gartner, been around the block, seen many, many cycles, uh, excited about what IBM has, needs to kind of cl you know, clean up their, their position, get more data and product, don't get stuck in the middle, um, and just good stuff. So IBM got good review from Merv here on theCUBE. We'll be right back after this short break with our next guest.